Today's show is brought to you by BipSync, the research management software for modern investors. BipSync works to define and accelerate your approach to manager selection, diligence, oversight, and analysis in one integrated research platform. They count as clients some of the largest fund of funds, endowments, foundations, pensions, and family offices, including some of the most prestigious past guests on the show. Want to learn more but don't know where to start? BipSync has developed segmented buyer's guides tailored to your fund's specific needs. Visit bipsync.com slash guide to download your free copy. Today's show is also brought to you by Janice Henderson Investors. In an environment where allocators face more questions than answers, having a trusted partner is critical. Janice Henderson Investors is committed to building partnerships with institutional investors based on collaboration, insights, and transparency. With 26 offices and 350 investment professionals worldwide, Janice Henderson has the scale to offer global perspective across equities, fixed income, and alternatives, and the depth to offer local expertise and support for clients. To learn more about partnering with Janice Henderson, visit JaniceHenderson.com slash institutional. Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting CapitalAllocators.com. My guest on today's show is Eric Serrano Bernson, the founder and CEO of Stable Asset Management, whose mission is to back the founders of tomorrow's leading investment firms. Our conversation starts with Eric's own experience from launch to around $3 billion in assets under management today. We turn to the lessons he's learned providing strategic capital, advice, and support to investment founders early in their life cycle. We discuss the qualities that make for successful founders and the factors to maximize the probability of success across building teams, attracting capital, and staying resilient. We close with Eric's perspective on the seeding business. Please enjoy my conversation with Eric Serrano Brunson. Eric, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Ted. Thank you for having me. We're going to talk a lot about backing alternative founders. If this is some semblance of a seeding business, we should start when you were a little seedling. Take me through your background and how you came to this business. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, let me congratulate you on having built capital allocators from seedling into such an amazingly useful resource. (laughs) So I'm half Spanish, half Norwegian, which explains the strange accent and very long name. I grew up in Spain. Dad was a doctor by training. He had three degrees, but he decided to stop practicing medicine quite early and start his own firm. And that became a consulting firm. So from a young age, I was quite interested in building my own business. And not only to be a master of my time, which my father always said was the ultimate privilege, but to build something that I could look back on and be proud of. And my mom was an air stewardess. She tells me this was super glamorous back in the 60s. I think the world has changed. And then when I was born, she started working for the Norwegian embassy. So she's still disappointed I became a capitalist, actually, instead of working at the United (laughs) Nations or be a diplomat like her. And I always tell her, hey, mom, you know, I'm actually investing capital, building things, ensuring pensioners have retirement income, helping charitable foundations. It makes her somewhat happy, but not, not entirely happy with my career choice. So looking back at, at school days, I guess, starting at the beginning, loved studying, loved learning. I'm an only child, which people think means that you're spoiled and selfish. But I think it means you really like people and hanging out with others because you didn't have that. I loved quiz shows. I loved playing Trivial Pursuit. And I think the most fun part of school for me was joining the dots between different fields. So when it it came time to come to university, I was like, hey, can I study the broadest thing possible? But in Spain, everything's very vocational. You know, in Europe, you have to decide when you're 16, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor or something. And you guys here in the US, I think with liberal arts have, have cracked it. But I looked around and then I found this degree called politics, philosophy and economics. And I thought, good, this is broad enough. And in hindsight, it was awesome because I became convinced that you can't really understand economics without understanding philosophy. You know, forget about efficient markets and rational actors. I think, what do the humans that are building our economy really espouse as their philosophy? And you can't understand 
the implementations of those philosophies into economics without understanding politics. And then university ends and it ends really quickly because in, in the UK you only study for three years. So that, that felt a bit short. And I was like, where can I continue to learn? But now I need to get paid to learn because I didn't have a lot of money back in the day. So I'm searching for a place where I can get training again, really wide. And I thought I need to become more of a practitioner. A lot of these theories I've learned at school will not survive impact with reality. So I get some advice from some of my older peers at school and they tell me you should really try consulting. So I end up at Bain & Co because they were super entrepreneurial. They'd already spun out all these firms investing across asset classes, what became Bain Capital. They had Sankety and Credit. They had Brookside and hedge funds. So I also saw a path there to getting into investing. And what I find is huge intellectual curiosity, big on analysis, big on frameworks. Today, my team calls me a complete framework addict. But it was really that focus on applying those tools to the real world that I found super fun. And they were focused on generating returns. They had this owner operator mentality, what they later called founders mentality. And a lot of my time there was spent improving and growing businesses. And I gravitated towards investment firms. So I spent a lot of time on banks and big asset managers. But a few years into my career there, I, I realized I was spending most of my time helping established businesses grow. But the problem with established businesses is they're incumbents and incumbents are a bit boring. They're bureaucratic. So they didn't really want to try new things. And what I found on the investing side was on top of those challenges that come with growth, I felt the structure as it related to their investors was fundamentally misaligned from day one. I think that's no secret. There's dynamics that over time make the GP and the LP relationship increasingly misaligned. Where did that take you from your time at Bain? So I'm there sitting at Bain and I'm thinking, I'd love to do something of my own I, to finally be a founder myself. And disclaimer here, I think I'm going to give you the retrofitted story. So it sounds linear and hopefully easy to follow. But let's be clear. It sounds like we always knew what what we were doing. That's not the case. I think most progress we made was through trial and error. You pilot something, it doesn't work. You pilot it again, it doesn't work. And then finally, you, you figure it out. You just go big with that, continually tweaking. To this day, we still improve every day. But not only is it retrofitted, but I have a a confession to make, which is I was at bait and I was thinking, okay, I'll try and build my own business, but I need a hedge because I had no confidence it was going to work. And on top of that, there were lots of technical aspects to investing that I felt I was missing. You know, the statistics, the econometrics, the options pricing, all these things that people talk about and you feel you're not dangerous enough to ask them questions about. And my hedge was... I'll go and do an MBA, and if it fails, I'll go back, find a job, and instead of saying, hi, Mr. Employer, I went to start an investment firm aimed at backing founders to have their own investment firms, but I failed. Here I am, give me a job. I'll say, look, I'm now super knowledgeable in all these other new things, please hire me. And I think that feeling of fear, that fear of failure, the fact that I needed a hedge for me is symptomatic of one of the obstacles maybe the main obstacle to starting your own firm. And looking back, that was especially true in Europe, I think where it's more of a stigma, where I think in the US, failure is seen more as a badge of honor, as a positive learning experience. And I think that's reflected, obviously, in the fact that the US is is a leading entrepreneurial market. And I wish in school, I had been taught that you'll never come up with anything original unless you're prepared to fail. And one of my roles today as a backer of founders is to give them that confidence to just try. How did you go from Bain to founding Stable? So it's 2008. The world is on fire. And I decide this is the best time to start a firm because the incumbents are completely overwhelmed by what's going on. Office space is cheaper. Salaries are cheaper to hire people. And luckily, I'm armed with this necessary but not sufficient condition for entrepreneurial success, which is a very healthy dose of self-confidence and uh, delusional optimism. Because I think if you're not delusionally optimistic, you'd never start a business. And that's how the idea for Stable is born. So I felt I knew the investing side of the equation and the operational side of the equation, but I was really missing access to capital. And you can have a great idea, but if you don't have capital to put behind it, it probably just stays an idea. So the first thing I had to do was figure out, okay, who do I go for capital? And who are the people that are interested in backing an emerging manager? And that's what 
took me on the journey of figuring out what are the challenges founders face when building an investment firm. And that's what inspired the frameworks we use today, which is we care about two stakeholders. We care about the founders on one side and we care about allocators on the other. And we had to understand what are the challenges the founder faces and what are the challenges the allocator faces. And the founder ones were more intuitive to me as a founder myself, but really empathizing with what is the career risk? What is the portfolio risk that an allocator is taking when making a bet on an emerging manager as opposed to playing it safe with established players? So why don't we walk through those frameworks? So start with the founders. What is the framework you use to think about how you're serving founders? The challenge on the founder side is that a lot of the skills that make you a great investor are typically not the ones you need to build an investment firm. Sometimes you'll find founders that are gifted at both and they're like unicorns. So if you find one, you should immediately try and partner with them. Great investors are typically contrarian and you need that to generate returns. You have to see things others don't. You have to believe something that others don't. And that involves strong analytical skills, being very detail oriented, whereas successful business builders are consensus builders. They have strong interpersonal skills. They think big picture. They have cross-functional breadth. And that cross-functional breadth is something that doesn't make itself evident up front. Investment firms are really two very different things meshed together. They're a portfolio and they're a business in the business of managing that portfolio. And and that distinction is, is often lost, I think. So to address that challenge, we figured out we have to develop an operating partner platform. So sort of private equity, venture capital inspired. We built a team, we built resources such as playbooks, how-to guides. We we built monthly processes that would provide founders with hands-on business building support. And we think about it in two buckets, operations and distribution. So let, let me walk you through both. On the operational side, it's everything from partnership agreements, uh, shadow equity agreements, fund governance documents, selecting service providers. What we're really doing here is ensuring best practice. But on top of that, we also want to future proof the business because decisions you make day one will come and haunt you a few years later. And I learned this myself. A lot of the wise things we do are because we got them wrong and we fix them. And that's because we already have seen the full life cycle of an investment firm. It's not that we're smarter than anyone else or this is rocket science. It's just that we know what challenges to expect and how we might help mitigate them showing up later today. And then on the distribution side, it's all about efficiency. So one thing I really struggled with building stable was that raising capital is a black hole of time. You know, like I mentioned, I was an investment professional. I'd never met an LP in my life. I didn't know how they thought. And every hour that you're raising capital you're not investing. So the opportunity cost is huge. So it's stable. Our goal with founders is to focus them on the right allocators at the right time. And that's because most allocators will meet with most investment opportunities. Everyone takes a meeting when you launch your first private equity fund or your first venture fund or your first hedge fund. But 90% of them are just learning from you. They're not necessarily going to invest in your first fund or in the first three years of your hedge fund. So focusing time on the right allocators at the right time in the life cycle of a founder is really the way I think we add the most value. And we borrow a lot from venture investors here that focus on supporting the founder. So we take much more of an advisory role. It's not a directive one saying, do this or do that. I I think you need to earn the right to give advice. And it helps that we've built a successful investment firm ourselves and we won the trust of some amazing investors ourselves and built some great businesses. But we still need to sit down with the founders and say, look, here's what we did when we faced this issue. Here's what we got wrong. Here's what worked for us. You know, it might not work for you. We've seen this situation before and this is how it played out. And that founder to founder conversation is invaluable. But you need to underscore we're not smarter. We've just done it all before. We've built over, what is it now, 20 businesses from scratch to multi-billion dollars. And it's just we've seen many of these movies before and we know how they end. So I'm not saying our approach is necessarily the best. There's many ways to skin the cat when it comes to supporting founders. There's actually this fantastic book called The Power Law by Sebastian Malabai. And it gives you a history of VC, but moreover, it goes deep into how each legendary VC firm invests. 
and how they support their founders. And all these stories around, did they step in and replace the founder? Were they supportive of apparent madness of founders? The styles are very different, but all of them succeed in one way or another. So yeah, I really recommend that book, both for founders and allocators. The part of that distribution challenge is an information gathering one where it'd be easy if you were backing someone in a certain strategy and you knew this group of allocators is interested in that strategy now. How do you gather that information so that you have it in your hands and can deliver that to someone that you're working with? First of all, I'd say it's not an exact science. Second, I'd say what people are looking for changes more rapidly than you'd think, given everyone espouses a longer term view. But one tool that we use a lot is our CRM system. So there we have 15 years of interactions with LPs. And as you get to know LPs, you really get a sense for the style of investing they have, the types of founders they like to back, the stage of the life cycle of a firm that they like to get in at. And all those things helps build a profile. So I think that fundamental profile is more important than necessarily what they're looking for at any one time. I think there's sort of a core preference set of attributes. And that varies by investor, but you also can make vague generalizations by investor type, be them endowments and foundations, be them family offices, be them fund of funds, big pensions. And so what we try and do is we try and create pre-briefs for our partners on the investors that are most likely to resonate with that founder's investment strategy. And it also involves having touch points with, with all these allocators. We spent huge amounts of time just comparing notes with other allocators and figuring out, okay, what types of investment strategies are now deemed to be more interesting. It tends to be a bit of a rear view mirror exercise. What we find incredibly powerful in trying to predict which investment strategies might face more benign market environments is actually just look at the data of the ideas that are being presented to us. So we get a lot of inbounds and we also have a more prepared mind, sort of proactive sourcing approach. But a lot of the ideas that come across our desk are really driven by the founders. So the founders will say, hey, this is a strategy I've been investing in for a long time. It's now the right time for me to start a business. And at the same time, there's all these tailwinds for my strategy. It's like early warning signals. So you start seeing these clusters. So maybe three, four years ago, we saw healthcare clusters. Very early on, we saw that there were very talented founders wanting to start healthcare firms across asset classes. Recently, we've seen in the last couple of years, a lot of activity in, in equity capital markets for example, or in strategies that are replacing lending or warehousing roles that financial institutions were playing. And that for us is an even more powerful way to then match managers with investors who have historically been interested in that or are also sharing thoughts around how attractive that space might be. Curious on the allocator side, you mentioned as the other key stakeholder, most of the time you're in front of an investment manager as you said, they are driving what they do, their strategy, they're hoping to attract capital. How do you think about it from the allocator's perspective and how you're trying to serve the allocator? I think there's three obstacles to investing in an emerging manager from the allocator point of view. First is how do you diligence these emerging managers? Second, how do you manage your own risks as an allocator? And finally, it's how do you create alignment when investing with an emerging manager? So let's take each of them in turn. On the diligence side, the way we have come to think about it is that when you're underwriting an investment in an emerging manager, there's three areas that you really need to dig into. There's investment questions, there's operational questions, and there's commercial questions. So in terms of investment, there's a few things that are particularly important with emerging manager investing. One is the evolution a founder has to make from being an employee, being an analyst, being a VP, you know, depends in, in which markets you're playing. But essentially, you're the number two, number three, and you're evolving into the number one, into the founder. And one issue is that the skills that you've been using as a number two 
aren't necessarily the same ones that you need as a number one. So let's take public markets as an example. As an analyst, you tend to focus a lot on security selection, sort of fundamental analysis. But as you become a portfolio manager, you also need to be good at portfolio construction, your timing, sizing, and you need to be good at exposure management. So we, we spend a lot of time trying to disaggregate these skills and figuring out, has this analyst spent time learning these portfolio manager skills? And it depends, you, you know, some firms are quite hierarchical. So analysts don't get as, as much exposure and they're not able to develop those skill sets as much. Some are more flat. Some of them get their own books early on in their careers. So depending where they're coming from, the type of culture and training they had, then we can be more or less happy with whether they're going to make that transition correctly. And in private markets, it's similar. When you're a managing director or a director, you're not quite leading the deals. You might spend a lot of time on, on the fundamental analysis, but maybe you haven't been involved in sourcing the opportunity, or maybe you're not involved in managing the relationship with the management team and in structuring the opportunity. So we really need to understand what your skill sets are and where the lacunas are in that evolution to founder and leader. Another one that's very important on the investment side is what we call person versus seat. Fancy word for that would be personal alpha versus organizational alpha. And we ask a lot of the founders we meet, okay, when you leave your current firm, you know, what are you going to miss? And I think there's a behavioral bias in life that affects all of us, which is we assign too much causality to our success, to our own doing, and not the people around us or luck or other, other exogenous variables. So even when you ask someone, they honestly tell you, oh, you know, I'm not going to miss much. It's actually going to be better when I'm on my own. Generally speaking, there's a blind spot there. And so we spend a lot of time digging into what are the sources of edge? Is it the size of your old firm? Is it the brand? Is it the relationship network? Is it one of your colleagues who's very risk conscious and taps you on the shoulder and prevents you from doing crazy things? And it's not that we won't back you if a lot of that is staying behind, but then the question becomes, of the things that are not coming with you, can you replicate them and in what period of time? So we try and, again, disaggregate sources of edge and make that analysis. And if we believe that a high percentage of that edge is coming with you or the percentage that isn't can be replicated within a reasonable period of time and at a reasonable cost, then we can proceed. On the operational side, that's really more just about cost and complexity. It's more about making sure this is a business that we feel we have expertise in supporting and that we feel is a business that can start at a relatively small scale compared to perhaps its previous incarnation. And then the third, the commercial, this is probably the leg that's most unique to backing founders and building investment firms versus being a passive limited partner. And on the commercial side, we're really trying to assess, does this founding team have the potential to have a business built around them? So we think about it at the person level. Is this a person who can build trust with investors? Can they attract and retain talent? Can they explain what they do? And then we think about it at a strategy level. Is, that, is this a strategy that has a sustainable edge? Does it have a role to play in investor portfolios? And then we think about it at peer group level, which is what are the alternatives to this new business? Are there incumbents? Is it oligopolistic? Are incumbents also raising capital? Are they closed? Are they raising a fund, this vintage, or is it between vintages? And all of that consideration is more around the potential to actually attract follow-on investors after we've invested our, our own capital. That's the diligence side of things. When it comes to how to manage the allocator risk, there's three ways to do that. One is alignment, which I'll get to in a second. The second is to communicate the right expectations. Because emerging managers have a higher failure rate, what happens is that the leadership of the allocating community is fearful of the career risk that sort of those failures can bring. But if you set expectations properly and communicate very proactively from the beginning, then I think you can sort of nip that in the bud. And when those failures inevitably happen, that's within expectations. And the third way to mitigate that allocator risk, career risk, is to build portfolios. So when these investment firms fail, they don't actually fail much. There's many ways to protect downside across asset classes. And when failures occur, it tends to be pedestrian, uninspiring performance, or it's related to the team gelling, or it's really not very often that you'll have significant 
capital loss. But when these investment firms are successful, they're very profitable. And so the win-loss ratio is very asymmetric. When these businesses are successful, as long as you build a portfolio of them, then you can have that positive expectation. And that's the way that you end up with delivering great results by investing in, in emerging managers. And then finally, the alignment piece. This is all about structuring. So for us, alignment is about fair upside sharing and relationship optionality. So what does that mean? We want to build alignment that will withstand the test of time. And so because these investment firms are very profitable businesses to own, and the more you invest in them, the more valuable they become. We think it's fair that if we invest with you and help you build your business, we want to be partners in your business. So this way, as the business grows, not only are we making a return on our investment capital, but we're also making a return from the success of your business. And this mitigates the misalignment around over time, a huge part of the upside from these businesses coming from management fee versus performance fees, which tends to occur over time. And we've, we've all seen that movie. And secondly, we want to make sure that we can grow with you. So we want to deploy more capital with you. We want to have aligned fee structures. We want, to, we want capacity reservations. We want to take advantage of unique opportunities along the way together. So all those avenues we build in from day one into our investments. And that's great for the founder too. They get to have a supportive partner that enables them to take advantage. And it really changes the conversation. In an LPGP relationship, Oftentimes, it's a bit adversarial. It feels like a zero-sum game. The, the allocator wants to reduce fees. The founder wants to increase fees. But when you're actually in the same boat, that adversarial uh, zero-sum game disappears. And now you're really both benefiting from building something together. And not only does it make for a more fun and healthier relationship, but it makes for much more profitable relationships too. So when you get outside of the bounds of the relationship that you are having with the GP in any of these strategies, and then start to think about other allocators who need to invest in those funds for them to grow, how do you think about those issues and in the way that you want these firms to attract capital that still may have, for example, that adversarial GPLP relationship? That's a very difficult question to answer, but I'll try and answer it with some examples. When I started the business, I thought that I would be convincing my founders to keep fees high, for example. And actually, it's been the opposite. I find a lot of my time is coaching and sharing my own experiences building stable with the managers we back around the fact that you have to be a long term thinker. And you have to think about the relationship in a less monetary way and in a more strategic way. Let me give you an example. If a large institution comes and wants to invest with you fairly on in, in your life cycle, particularly large institutions like pension funds or sovereign wealth funds are quite fee sensitive. But the advantage of partnering with such institutions is that they're very large. They continue growing. They're very long term. We find them to be more understanding in periods of underperformance because they are so long term and they have less pressures in terms of clients or stakeholders that some of the other LP segments might have. So it's a very valuable relationship on a long term basis. And as I was just mentioning, growing with you is what you really want to try and achieve as a manager. And these are the types of institutions who as you grow your investment firm can also enable you to do new and exciting things in, in adjacencies to your strategy. So I find myself actually saying, yes, you should discount fees. You should agree to these requests from the institution, may it be around transparency, may it be around governance, may it be around structure. They're really meant to align incentives. And you have to think long term that these will pay off hugely if this is a relationship you can nurture, earn the trust of, and then grow with. And something I often share with my founders is you want to keep complexity low because I think both complexity and size to a certain extent are the enemies of performance. And a quick definition of complexity when you're running investment firms is number of investors, number of strategies, and number of employees squared. So one of the things you want to keep small is number of investors, because as we mentioned, managing relationships takes a lot of time. These investors might take a bit longer 
to do their due diligence or feel that you've achieved a certain track record or even size. So they come later in the life cycle, but they're fantastic partners to have. So you have to therefore be flexible about what demands you have. And you have to think strategically, not about fees today. Think about everything you can do together in the next 10, 20 years. I want to take some of these frameworks and put them into practice of how you go about it. So let's just start with sourcing and the identification of managers. So you're looking across asset classes in alternatives. So you know, hedge funds, private equity, venture capital. How do you start to figure out which particular managers you want to take a close look at? Yeah. So taking a step back, we think of sourcing in two ways. There's proactive sourcing and reactive sourcing. So reactive sourcing is fairly straightforward. We get approached with tons of ideas. Most of them are lower quality, but there's still some diamonds in the rough. And then we have this proactive approach, which is a bit like that prepared mind approach. We study areas where we think there's higher return potential. There might be structural reasons why we think a founder might have an edge. And then our philosophy is let's start sourcing as early as we can in the founder's journey to start a business. You put yourself in the founder's mind. This is similar to my experience building stable. What are the first things you do when you want to start your own investment firm? You think about, okay, I should talk to a lawyer about the fund structure. I should talk to a compliance consultant to see how much the regulatory fees and, and how long the timeline is to get regulated. Or you want to talk to people who help design logos and pick colors. And it's really about empathizing with that journey. And the sooner you can get involved, the sooner you can build conviction in that manager, the more time you have to spend with him or her, and they have time to spend with you. But on top of that, you can also help them not make the usual mistakes we see with emerging managers. So a lot of emerging managers tend to go to market way before they're baked. And it's interesting because structurally, the industry propels them to do so. So for instance, in public markets, you have you know, cap intro teams and in private markets, you have placement agents. Their role is to connect managers to investors. And they want to be helpful to the manager because they want to work with them. And they want to be helpful to investors because ultimately those are the allocators who are going to invest with the managers they work with. But the issue is that that creates this sense of urgency to be the first to present this idea. And what ends up happening is the manager doesn't have a, a well-baked idea on how he's going to structure the business, has not managed to figure out how to explain easily what they do. And that leads to what we call scorched earth. And we have a measure of this in our sourcing. We try to understand, has this manager already interacting with a number of potential investor partners? Because it's very hard to make a first impression twice. And in our industry, we see so many opportunities that revisiting something we've discarded actually has a higher bar than looking at something new, which is also kind of an interesting behavioral bias. And we try and correct that. And we actually try to revisit things as much as we can. But all that is to say that the sooner you are in their journey, the more efficient your sourcing is going to be. And then that means you have to develop relationships with all these service providers and stakeholders in the industry that have early touch points. And at the same time, to be able to triage them, because you end up with huge amounts of different leads, you have to have this prepared mind. You have to have a view of what types of strategies you want to be investing in. So for, for example... What have we done recently? We've backed founders building equity capital markets businesses, big access alpha. They're playing a role in capital markets on top of fundamental work. In private credit, we've done a lot of work on litigation finance, a less mature part of the market, very specific experience and sourcing capabilities, or even royalties. There's some very interesting sourcing and structuring an edge that you can have in music, royalties, sports and entertainment royalties, tax receivables. Or in private equity, you know, we've invested a fair bit in venture and private equity in the healthcare space, even pre-COVID. I think huge knowledge bar required, even back to healthcare business in China. So there you're layering sectorial expertise requirements with geographic focus, meaning even less competition and more edge. You touched earlier on some of the key aspects of the diligence process. And I'm curious in particular, this idea of teasing out on the investment skill side, what was attributable to the person versus the organization where they were involved previously. How do you go about doing that? It varies by asset class. I think in private markets, it's a bit easier 
it tends to be clearer in an organization who has sourced the deal, who was involved with management team, who was structuring it. And so a lot of the focus in private markets is to go to previous deal, previous portfolio companies, talk to those management teams and ask them, you know, who was responsible for for making this happen. I think in public markets, it's much more complicated. And obviously, we're often dealing with no track record. And their referencing is really what can give you some comfort. And also tracking paper portfolios and also digging deep in questions around these skill sets that we mentioned. So let me touch on each one. On the reference side, we try and go as 360 as possible. So you're trying to speak to ex-colleagues of this person. There's some temporal issues there if the person is still employed. So you might be talking to ex-colleagues who are no, no longer that firm or colleagues who are aware of this person's desire to start their own firm. But you also want to be talking to market participants, sell-side analysts, people who are familiar with whether or not this particular person was making the calls. And then you also want to be talking to the management teams, similarly to private equity. Go to management teams and ask them, who are the best analysts covering your firm? And often it's an open-ended question. And you're hoping that in the two or three names that the CEO or CFO or COO mentions is this particular person or the firm this particular person works at. And if they mention a firm, and this happens often, you say, who within that firm is asking the best questions? That's on the referencing side. Something like the paper portfolio, being able to track managers from the moment they leave their firm to the moment they start, that can give us a lot of comfort. And then finally... Asking questions around the skill sets that we believe are more portfolio manager skill sets, like, for instance, okay, what's your portfolio construction approach? How do you size things? You have entry and exit defined. How will that change as evidence to the contrary changes? It's really a mosaic of all those things put together. But let's be frank, you know, we get it wrong. The thing that we most often get wrong, I think, is that portfolio manager evolution and this organizational alpha identification. I think the way we've managed to stop that from happening is often we will back a person who perhaps was at a firm that didn't do what they were doing before they arrived. I'm curious when you start thinking about the types of people that have been successful, these number twos, number threes that are now going on to lead a firm, what are the characteristics of those people that you found are conducive to future success with more consistency than others, not that it's ever perfect? Yeah, the, the million dollar question. So this is an area of focus for us since we started the firm, absolutely fascinating. I think in general, there is a lot of weight in diligence processes put on the investment strategy. But at the end of the day, we're investing in people. And if you have a long-term view that you're going to partner with a person for 10, 20 years, I think understanding the person is as important, if not more, than understanding their investment strategy. And I would argue in some ways the core characteristics of the person are more likely to stay the same than that of markets. So from a rational point of view, the, the one constant is the person and underwriting their behavior in 10 years' time. It's probably an easier thing to do than underwriting how their markets are going to be in 10 years, which is an interesting thought experiment. Since the beginning at Stable, we've put a lot of effort into what we call manager background due diligence. And it has several components, but the objective is to identify certain backgrounds and certain personality traits uh, in people. And we have a data-driven approach where we look for evidence around which personality traits and which backgrounds are more predictive of future success. So we have tools that we've developed around really getting to know the person very deeply. And this is a privilege that we have as a firm because I think we spend a lot more time with each founder than a typical allocator would because we make less investments a year. Uh, we partner for a long term. We lock up our capital for a long period of time. And obviously we're building a business with them. So it gives us license to ask very personal questions that potentially a more traditional LPGP encounter wouldn't allow. We're looking for background and personality traits. So how do we try and tease that out? So on the background side of things, over the years, we add to it and it becomes longer and longer. We have a questionnaire and it's called past, present and future. 
And what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand where you come from, what did your parents do, when did you start being interested in investing? And all of these questions are linked to research that shows that, for example, managers, founders from poor backgrounds tend to outperform managers from richer backgrounds or managers that lose a parent young or have divorced parents or face adversity young are better performers or managers that show passion and interest at a, at a very young age also typically correlate with more passion and not the fact that later in life you realize this was a very lucrative industry so you wanted to be a part of it and actually on, on that age aspect we did a, an interesting project we call it project legends and it's across asset classes but we took you know in our view all the best public and private investors and the age at which the public managers launched their business was 33 which i think shocks people because they probably think that's too young but i think that's correlates with the data that shows that if you're really passionate and have a clear idea of what you want to build, you tend to be quite impatient and you want to do your, things your own ways, which ends up meaning that you launch things sooner. And in private markets, the age is a bit higher, which I think is due to the fact that private markets are more relationship driven. You need more time to establish the networks. They might put a bit more weight on gray hair and so forth. But even there, interestingly, a lot of the better private equity business builders, you actually see like a duo setup where you have a very young founder and an older founder. So at TPG, you have Coulter and Bonderman. At Blackstone, you have Schwartzman and you had Peterson. And I think all those dynamics show they kind of aggregate into a meta structure where there's two drivers of success. One is variant perception. We mentioned that before. It's basically seeing other, seeing things others don't see, believing things others don't believe. If you want to make money in investing, you just have to be contrarian and you have to be comfortable being in that minority. So if there are things in your life that made you that minority because you were poorer than your classmates or because you were the only Catholic kid at a Jewish school or vice versa, that will mean that your variant perception is stronger. And the other thing we're looking for is resilience. It's really never giving up. And again, that's very tied to adversity, but it's also things like being an immigrant or growing up in a different country to the country you study or work in. All these indicators actually have great basis in data and studies. And we try and always grounded in data because I think often we have these heuristics that we develop over our life that potentially bias us in the wrong way. And typically most research shows that we pick people from similar backgrounds to us or who agree or look like us. So we're trying to correct all those. And what we end up with is an assessment of someone's background that I think is very powerful. The past is important. The second aspect is the present. You know, what do you do with your time? How many hours do you work? Uh, what car do you drive? And then the future analysis is all about what business you want to build, what culture you want to build, how do you define success? And in past and present, there are more right and wrong answers and there are better backgrounds. But in the future, what's interesting is, is really we're looking for thoughtfulness. We're looking for how much have you really thought about how are you going to attract talent? How are you going to compensate them? How are you going to present what you do and build trust with investors? And all this together hopefully gives us some indication of your potential future success. Okay, I want to turn to how you think about stable and the business in the perspective of the industry and the landscape itself. And so the first obvious question is small versus large. So we're seeing in all of these alternative asset classes an increase in concentration with legacy players, more and more assets going to the big hedge funds, the big private equity firms, the closed venture capital firms. How do you think about the ability of someone that you're backing to have a competitive advantage against some of these larger incumbent players? Yeah, so I'm obviously biased here and I, I don't like monopolies or oligopolies. A lot of the consolidation in the industry is attributed to this narrative that the bigger you get, the more resources you have, so the better you are. I have a controversial view of this. I actually think a lot of the consolidation of assets in the industry is more correlated to the allocator side of the equation. Like I mentioned, this career risk and desire to play it safe. And obviously, I'm generalizing here, but I think allocators will 
avoid going emerging for the wrong reasons. And we've discussed ways to mitigate that. Our view is actually that growth is good up to a point and then it reaches diminishing returns. And so the way we think about it is at sort of three levels. One has to do with investing. One has to do with the operational side and one has to do with the emotional side. And I think the returns to scale and the returns to success affect both the founder in these three areas and the firm itself. On the investment side, when you're small, you're the insurgent, you're disrupting the incumbents, you're more focused by definition, you have less scope. And in our opinion, narrow focus is typically a big plus in investing. Of course, you need to have cross-disciplinary mental models, but you need focus in terms of area of expertise and circle of competence. So we find that when you're smaller, you have more original ideas and how you source deals can be differentiated. You have to be more innovative by definition. And you don't have these disadvantages of scale where you have to do the next mega deal if you're a private manager. You need to do that next mega trade if you're a, a public manager. On the operational side, similar story. You know, A founder has more bandwidth to invest when the firms are smaller because there's less firm to manage. The firm is more nimble. You're in one office. The team fits in a room. You don't need to fill in a form to get a new laptop. There's less reporting lines. There's less politics. And on the emotional side, which I think is the more fascinating one, when you're smaller, you're hungrier. You have to prove yourself. You're typically younger. You have more energy. You have less distractions. And you have less inherited biases. And that reflects in firm culture. We all see insurgents continually disrupting incumbents. And we think all those advantages tend to disappear as you grow. And I say tend because some founders and some firms do manage to retain that founder mentality, but very few do. So once you're successful, you go from competing on performance and self-improvement to competing on status or legacy. And that's all great for humanity, but I'm not sure it's great for performance in your day job. And so for that reason, we believe that if you look under the hood, the strength is actually in that more small to medium-sized managers or the ones that indeed grow big but manage to retain that founder mentality. And I think we've seen it. When you look at performance of large asset managers, that tends to be very inversely correlated with size. And there's great data around this. And I, I'm not sure anyone would dispute it. But of course, I do understand that it's an easier investment to go with a large established player. And that's a bit what we fight when we're backing founders and trying to build these insurgents. How do you think about that in the context of the increasing use of technology across industries, and in this case, as it applies to asset management and the need to have resources to be able to invest into the next frontier of technology? So clearly, technology is disrupting investing. And we think about it in terms of how it can produce more data to make better investment decisions. We think about it in terms of how can you use these technologies in your own firm to make better decisions. And then we think about it in terms of how is that technology going to disrupt the businesses that each strategy is, is investing in. And where we're focusing our efforts is on the middle part of that value chain, which is really about what type of technologies can we use to run better investment firms. And a lot of that has to do with data acquisition, data management, and essentially knowledge management. So what's kind of fascinating is that although investment firms do a lot of work on the investments that they make, they often don't take the same approach and the same critical and analytical lens on themselves. So what we find is that in investment management, there's actually quite a gap in terms of technological use for the business of investing. One thing that we're doing is we're trying to get involved with firms that are in the invest tech, fintech space, which are firms that are allowing founders to be finding better data to inform decisions, but also to manage that data better internally. So it's about tracking how the idea came on the radar, 
tracking what work was done, tracking how it actually went, doing post-mortems as well as pre-mortems. And we find that managers that use technology in the way they invest, not only as an input into what they invest in, are the ones that are going to have an edge. And in terms of our own investing, we're actually avoiding areas where we think the technological cost or complexity is too high. So for example, in public markets, I think there's huge money to be made in high frequency trading or in strategies that require hugely expensive data sets or in quant alternative data quant strategies. But really that isn't our strength because by definition at the beginning, the founders we back don't have huge budgets, don't have huge scale. So it's bound to be a battle you're going to lose. And I'm curious to hear a little bit about your competition at Stable and what you're seeing among your peers who are also looking to back emerging managers. We think this business is a fantastic business to be in, not only because it makes great returns, but because it creates all this optionality and alignment. There aren't actually that many players that do what we do. I think historically in public markets, there were more players, but typically they came from fund of fund backgrounds or allocator backgrounds, and they took a very strategy focused lens on backing new founders. So we think our approach of being more operator focused has been differentiated. And that's helping us not only attract the best talent, I think, but in maximizing the the probabilities of success. In private markets, there's actually even less competition. There's less systematized approach to backing emerging managers, but we're seeing that change. You know, there's a number of new entrants who realize the power of not only owning these businesses, but having a, a closer relationship with the managers that they back. And we're seeing also in private markets, there is a new wave of investors that are very interested in establishing strategic partnerships with emerging managers. And we're seeing it both in terms of actual institutions, large sovereigns around the world, large pension funds are really coming around to the realization that if you can partner with a manager in a more aligned way, you're bound to make better returns, and you're bound to extract more value from that relationship. And some have tried to internalize a lot of these teams, but I think there you really bump into compensation issues, headline issues. You know, if you take teams and you put them inside large bureaucratic pensions or sovereigns, I think it's hard to do right. But there's this middle ground. Instead of just being a passive LP, you can also build strategic partnership somewhere in the middle where you're still a co-owner, where your incentives are still aligned. So we're seeing a lot of that. And that's happening both in public and private markets. We would love for more people to do what we do. There's a scarcity of willingness to go early, but there's so much talent out there that doesn't get funded. And often they don't get funded because they don't fit the right buckets. They don't have the right pedigree. They're not very good at presenting. And that for us is a hugely interesting and arbitrageable opportunity because at the core, when we back a manager, what inefficiency are we arbitraging? We're really finding a manager that the market, the allocator community feels there's some sort of issue. And we feel that either that issue that's perceived is not real And then there's issues which the market correctly identifies as an issue, but we think we can fix. And these are things to do with what we've been discussing today around maybe the founder is great at investing, but terrible at attracting talent or building a business or explaining what they do. And that's the gap that we fill so that together we complement a founder and we can then create a much more attractive value proposition for investors. Where do you think stable heads over the next five or 10 years? The dream for stable from the beginning has always been, we would love to back talented founders who want to run their own investment firm. And we would love to be able to do that no matter what type of strategy, in what asset class, in what sector, in what geography you want to do that. And you know, f- finally, after 15 years, we're an overnight success. 
And we feel that we've built enough trust with our investors and our partners to be able to do that. What I would love is to just be able to be even more helpful to those founders. And that means investing in our operational support, in our distribution support, in our technology. Because as you scale, I think a lot of that founder coaching and help is very personalized. We've invested a fair bit of time and money thinking about what are the tools that we can develop in order to be better partners to our founders. But at the same time, we can always do more. What I worry uh, about is, are we doing all we can do to maximize the probability of success with our founders? So what I would love to see us doing over the next few years is investing further in our capabilities to help the founders and also be able to support them in that journey. And all of those things require fresh capital. They require potentially capital in different parts of their capital structure, working capital, GP commit. And, you know, we'd love to be able to help founders with any of those strategic needs as they build their business so they can focus just on delivering returns. Well, Eric, I can't let you go without asking a couple of closing questions. So here we go. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I think it has to be eating. So <laughs> I, will, I will travel far and wide for best places to eat. You know, when I plan my investment research trips, I always plan where I'm eating every meal. I think it's because so many great things come together in a great meal. Chefs are obsessive about their craft. But at the same time, breaking bread is such a bonding experience. And when I look at some of the most fun times in my life, they're often around a table with people I love. That's great. What's your most important daily habit? I think it's bookending my day with positivity. So I think that can take many forms. For me, it's like a cuddle fest and a compliment fest. So telling my wife and children, I love you. You're awesome and receiving that back. I think it just allows you to recharge in the morning, get ready to deal with all the challenges and the setbacks that undoubtedly will come during the day. And it, it gives you that positive energy to fight. And then no matter what's going on during the day, you know you're coming back to your happy place as well. That's great. What's your biggest personal pet peeve? I think it has to be computer says no. And computer says no is when you hit an obstacle, and you start questioning it, and there's absolutely no good reason why that obstacle exists. And no one can give you a good reason why the answer is no, but it's just no. I, I find this happens a lot with airlines or interactions with governments, but it also happens a lot in investing. And I wish computer says no was deleted as an answer. How about on the investment side, your biggest investment pet peeve? It has to be when you observe a failure in someone to change their mind when the evidence changes. And I think we've been seeing a lot of this very recently as there's more and more esoteric reasons why markets are moving and companies are succeeding or failing. I think stubbornness is fantastic when you're fighting a majority that has a different view from you, right? Like that variant perception does require faith in what you believe. But when you're just fighting mounting evidence against your thesis, I think the issue is our industry tends to penalize changing your mind because it's seen as some sort of weakness or vulnerability. But actually, changing your mind is the most logical thing ever if the evidence is changing as well. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? I think I have to go all the way back to university. My tutor at Oxford was a gentleman called Larry Seedentop. And I think the reason why I would have to choose him as one of the two is he just got me on the path we are now. I do believe in self-determination and choosing your own path, but I also do believe in that sliding doors thesis, the kind of path dependency. I think there's these very punctual moments in life where there's a fork in the road and very often you're not conscious you're in it. But for me, I think him giving me the chance, you know, accepting me, giving access to this boy from Madrid to this prestigious university, seeing something in me really made a huge difference and enabled me to be where I am today. I think the second one, also formative experience, had to be at Bain. One of the Bain partners is a gentleman called Jimmy Allen. And he taught me two things. First, that you can work extremely hard, but you can have a lot of fun at the same time. And I don't know why 
oftentimes those two things are perceived to be opposites. But one thing he did amazingly well was he taught me the power of words, how important it is to be understood. And it really takes a lot of work to find the right words, to express something. And in your head, you think you're being understood. But actually, unless you make very precise and relatable word choices, you're not going to get your message across. So he, he didn't only teach me to think about business. I think he taught me how to speak about it. What's the biggest mistake you've made and what did you learn from it? Assuming other people know what they're doing or believing them if they tell you they know what they're doing. And I think the learning there for me was you have to trust but verify. You have to do your own work. And very often I think you can really improve on how things are being done because people haven't actually thought that hard about why things are the way they are. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? I think it must be going back to that feeling of positivity that we're here for a good time not a long time so the importance of enjoying life seeking to make those around you happy and surround yourself with people who make you happy great all right eric last one what life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life this might sound evident but i didn't realize that time is finite and that you can't buy time. So no matter how successful you get, you can't buy more of it. And not everyone will always be there, parents, friends. So don't delay things you want to get done because you might never get the chance to do them. Eric, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you, Ted. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. An important disclaimer from Janice Henderson Group, PLC. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principle and fluctuation of value.